I invite you to turn with me to the book of Mark. We are in Mark chapter 14. Today we're looking at verses 27 through 31. Well, really 26 through 31 here. The title of the sermon is called Christ Abandonment Foretold. So let's give attention to the reading of God's words, starting in, we'll start in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, I tell you, this, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his blessing to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are so thankful that we can come here again to hear your word. Lord, we pray that uh, through your spirit, you can illumine your word to our mind to understand it. Lord, we pray that you would set me aside, put Christ on display, and that we could receive the food of your word. And then, out of love and thankfulness, seek to live, live for you, for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we have been going verse by verse through the book of Mark, and we come to a section that we've really been uh, anticipating this whole time. And if you remember from the very beginning, Mark has been trying to convince us that Jesus is the Christ. We've been coming scene by scene, learning and being convinced of these things by seeing his miracles, by seeing the prophecies that foretold that this is what Jesus would do. We've seen him heal the lame. We've seen him give sight to the blind. We've seen him even uh, raise uh, someone from the dead. And he's done miraculous kind of things. And now as we get to this next week, what we see here is this is the Passover week. We, so we've been seeing this. We've been uh, seeing these scenes here. And Mark actually slows down his, uh, his scenes here so we can zoom in at this week. And the reason is because he wants us to show the cross and everything that that implies. And so while we are here, uh, this is just really hours before, uh, before the betrayal, before the cross here. And so we come to this, and if you recall, they have been celebrating the Passover meal. And in so doing, the Passover meal, we learn that this is a celebration that has happened for a while, all the way going back to the Exodus. It celebrates the redemption that God provides through the Passover lamb. Well, Jesus celebrates this with his disciples, as a good Jew would. And we saw that in the midst of this, he, is, uh, he also foretold about Judas' betrayal. And in so doing, they all look inwardly. They all ask, is it I? Is it I who's going to do the betrayal? When Jesus finished uh, talking about that, he actually then uh, instituted a new meal. So he departs from the traditional script of the normal Passover feast. And when he comes to the third cup and when he comes to the bread, he says something that has never been said before. And if you remember, he said, this bread is my body. He then takes the cup and says, this is my blood of the new covenant. And in so doing, these elements, rather than focusing on past events of a Passover lamb, he centers them now on himself to say, he is the true Passover lamb. He's the fulfillment of those things. He is the lamb who will cover the sins of his people and he will atone for their sins. And this is why the New Testament authors, or we have First Peter in particular, who says, knowing you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish. And as Paul would call him, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And so Jesus here has instituted this meal. He has talked about these things. And now this is the night before he's crucified where he will fulfill all those things and truly be the Passover lamb. And that brings us to our next text here. They're finishing the meal, and then they depart to the Mount of Olives. And the big idea I want us to see here in, in this section is because Jesus is the Christ, he's going to be on a divine, divine schedule. He foretells that he will face abandonment, yet he presses on. 
so that he could be our suffering servant. And in so doing, he shows that he is sovereign and in control. So we're going to see this in two ways here. First, we're going to see that Jesus did operate according to a divine plan. And then second, that Jesus did know the weakness and self-confident of his disciples. This didn't come as a surprise to him. So let's first look at Jesus operating according to this divine plan. And look again at verse 26. It says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so this was the last part of the Passover meal, as we saw last time. There would be the different cups. They came to the third cup. He redefined what it meant. And he said it's, it's his blood of the new covenant. And then they came to the fourth cup. And the fourth cup, if you remember, the promise was, I will gather my people. And remember, Jesus leaves the cup and says, I will not drink of this cup until I gather with you again in the kingdom. And so from there, they would sing a psalm to finish the Passover meal. And they actually sang, song, uh, sang Psalm 115, which we sang earlier, to 118. And so these were the psalms or songbook, we can say, of the, the people of God. These were psalms that in particular spoke of the God's great redemption that we have in him. So that after they sang these songs, they depart from the, to the Mount of Olives. They leave the town, remember they're in Jerusalem, and they depart. And how they would happen is Jesus would follow this path where he would depart from the city. He'd go through the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. And if you're familiar with the scriptures, you might know that this is the same route that King David took when he was departing from the city. And it's actually when he was departing because his son Absalom was pursuing him because one of David's good friends, Apithophel, betrayed him. And so he goes up to the Mount of Olives as he's fleeing to pray. And in so doing, if you remember Jesus in our last passage last week, he actually quoted David here in that psalm, Psalm 41, verse 9, where David wrote about this betrayal. And Jesus quotes this and says, Even my close friend in whom I trust, who I ate bread with, has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus quotes this to apply it to himself to say he is the greater David. He goes the exact same route. He goes to the Mount of Olives here after he is betrayed also by Judas. So they've celebrated the supper, and now he is preparing to become that Passover lamb. He is preparing to go the way of the cross. And so he goes up to pray. And as they're up there, as, as this is happening, Jesus says, he said to them something shocking. It says, and he said to them, you will all fall away. So think about that. They, they just celebrated this feast. They've enjoyed these things. He's, he's given them new covenant promises here. He says he is that lamb. And what joy that must have been to be able to celebrate. And he says, all of you will betray me. That must have been shocking for them. They just heard that Judas will betray him. And now he says, all of you will fall away. It's, it's Judas, yes, he's going to betray. And, and they didn't fully know it was Judas at the time. They knew it was one who dips th there in the bread with him. But he says, all of you are going to fall away. In my hour of need, when, when I need you most, you're going to run in fear. And this was probably the last thing they expected to hear, especially how they have followed Jesus up to this point. Right? They left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus actually called them to be his disciples. And they've come so far, they've even went through this tumultuous week, being in Jerusalem, walking with him in the crowds, going against the scribes and Pharisees of the day. And they're here, they, they've, they've left everything, and Jesus says, yeah, you've come this far, but you're going to fall away, all of you. All of you will fall away. This, this word here for fall away, uh, you can hear kind of where we get our word scandal from. It, it's uh, scandal, scandalizomai, tongue twister, scandalizomai, which means a stumbling block. Uh, it, mean, it can mean to, to take an offense. And he, he's saying, you are all going to be offended by me. You are all going to be to stumble over me. And Jesus has used this word before. He actually, if you recall, he used it in Mark 4. 
And it's, and it's important to just see the dynamic range of these words, but to also know context determines our meaning. And this is important because we see this word used many different times. And in Mark 4, he uses it this way in verse 16, talking about the parable of the soils. He says, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who are, uh, who are the rocky ground, they will hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. And then when tribulation, persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And in context here, it's talking about this permanent falling away from the faith. They, you know, they, it was there. They had received it with joy. It sprouted up. It, it, it produced for a little bit. It showed all the signs of life. And then in the end, fell away and was scorched by the sun. You know, that probably describes Judas more than, than the disciples here. But he uses the same word. And it, that's why it's important to understand the context determines meaning when words have dynamic range like this. The context here, as we know, isn't talking about a permanent falling away that these disciples are going to undergo, but a temporary loss in courage where they fall away. And we know this is the case because they're going to be restored. Jesus is going to gather them again. If you even look at the, the very last part of this verse, he says he's going to meet with them in Galilee. He's going to gather them again after he's raised but Jesus is saying, though you are mine, though you are my sheep, you're going to go through this hard trial. And there's going to be a time where, yes, you, you mean well, you mean to follow me, but you're going to fall away due to the pressure, due to the fear of persecution. So they're not falling away in a sense of losing their salvation, but it's a momentary lapse in their commitment to him. Yes, they're his true sheep, but they will fall. Jesus talked about himself being that shepherd, right? We've seen this before. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. But notice, notice here the permanency of those who are his sheep. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. He goes, you guys are going to fall away. You're, you're true sheep. I am your shepherd, but you're going to have this momentary lapse, but you're never truly lost forever. And notice how, how he's saying this. Notice the reason, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So Jesus is making much more than a prediction here. He, he's not just saying, you know, here's what I think. Here's my opinion on the, on the state of, of your faith right now. Jesus is doing this by giving the grounds for this in Scripture. Notice, for it is written. In other words, for or because. Here's my reason for saying what I'm saying. It's been written down. It's been prophesied that this is what's going to happen. This is part of the plan of salvation. This is part of God's divine decree for you guys who are in Sunday school. This is something that has been written because it was decreed before the foundations of the world. It is there and it is in the word of God. It's been revealed to us by the prophets what God's decree is. And it's been said, this is going to happen. This is part of the sovereign plan of God. And Jesus is taking this and saying, this applies to you guys here. Yes, you're following me. You're part of my, sh you're, you're, you're part of my flock. You're my sheep. I am your shepherd, but you will fall away. Jesus refers to himself, as we said, as that good shepherd. John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But notice, again, Jesus is quoting here Zechariah 13, which we had in our scripture reading. So this is where he's saying, it is written. This is what was written about me. And, and notice he says here that who is doing the striking? Notice it says, I will strike the shepherd. Jesus knew that he would be the shepherd who would be striked. He knew that he would, this is the whole reason that he came, for this purpose, to lay down his life as a ransom for many. And just turn to Zach, Zechariah 13 again, just so we can kind of see the context. And as you are familiar from the scripture reading, this is in context to false shepherds who are going to receive judgment. But then the Lord is going to say, even my true shepherd... My shepherd, 
he will also be striped. And it's because this is a messianic prophecy. And Jesus picks up on it. And notice here, just look at verse 7 here. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me. Notice who's talking. Declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The sword was the sword of judgment, judgment that would befall. And so he says, O oh, sword, awake. It's time to, to have judgment, and your judgment is going to fall against my shepherd. My shepherd of, of my people. Notice, against the man who stands next to me. This is, in other words, to say, this is my equal. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Jesus here, in the, in the passage here, in Mark, actually adds the first person here, the first person future. Where God here, the, 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 the Lord of hosts in, in Zechariah, is speaking to the sword, the sword of judgment that is going to be placed, and, and, and Christ here brings it up and says, I will strike the shepherd. Well, who is he talking about? He's saying God's doing the action here. God is the one who will do the striking. It's not the Romans who are doing the striking ultimately. They're secondary causes here that God is using ultimately to achieve his purposes, but it is God the Father who is striking his son in judgment. So Jesus isn't a victim of his circumstances that just fell on bad times and bad luck. That's not the case. Jesus is saying this is all according to the divine decree. The prophets prophesied about this, and here's an example of it. It's written, and, and the prophets are revealing this decree. Jesus is the good shepherd, but it's God the Father who will strike him down because this was the plan from the beginning of time. And then Isaiah 53. This isn't just Zechariah who talked this way. Isaiah 53 talked about it. Just listen to this, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. This is God the Father who is doing striking here. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. The striking of the shepherd is done none other by the Father and his plan. This is why it says in Romans 8, 20, uh, 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also in him graciously give us all things? God didn't spare his own son, but he allowed him to be stricken. And in so doing, in the striking of his shepherd, what he is showing us is he is just and he is holy. And if you think about it, we've already talked about what he requires of all of us, that he, we are righteous, that we obey his law. He's given us his law, but what have we done? We failed. We've sinned. Wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. Life is in the blood, so our blood ought to be shed. That would be justice if it ended there. But God in his grace, to show that he's holy and still just, he, he can't just merely forgive sin and wipe it under the carpet. He must punish sin. He sends his son, his shepherd. And in so doing, he bears our sin. He becomes that Passover lamb for us. And he lays down his life. His blood is shed for us. And in so doing, God strikes him down and treats him as a sinner, even though he never sinned. But he's doing it as our substitute, our Passover lamb. That all who have faith in him, their sins are forgiven because Christ, the true Passover lamb, the, the shepherd who was struck down, has bore their guilt. And we know that the Father has accepted this great sacrifice because he raised him from the dead on the third day. And he's now seated up there in heaven on the throne. But notice what is going to happen to the disciples in the midst of this. He says, I will strike the shepherd, God will strike the shepherd, the Father will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. The, result, the results here of the, the shepherd being striked is the sheep are going to scatter. They're going to disperse away. They're going to run away in fear. One person said this, When the shepherd is struck down, the sheep scatter in every direction, 
for they have lost their rallying point. So also when Jesus is captured and sub- subsequently is crucified, his, fo- his followers will panic and flee. Sheep are animals that get easily spooked and scared and run away. They wander. They do all sorts of different things. And when their shepherd is gone, there's no one to lead them. And so Jesus picks up on this and says, when the shepherd is is stricken, the sheep will scatter. You disciples, you're all going to flee. You're all going to fall away because you're my sheep. And the disciples are, are going to think in this time, well, if our shepherd just got striped, they got, he got killed, he got crucified, well, we who are closest to him, we might be next in line. And they get scared of the persecution. They get scared of these things. And they all fall away. And we know that happens. We're going to see that in this very next, later on in this chapter. And Jesus says, on that night when that happens... Tonight, you will all fall away. You will be scattered. Look again at Zechariah 13. And again, let's look at the context here and what follows after this because it's important on what he talks about is going to happen to the disciples. Zechariah 13, it says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And then we see this. I will turn my hand against the little ones. The whole land declares the Lord... Two-thirds shall be cut off and perish. One-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one's refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name. I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Now, in one sense, we see this with the scattering of Israel. All all of Israel will eventually be scattered. Well, within Israel, there is a remnant, the true believers who will follow the Lord. And, and God uses that. He uses the, the tribulation and trials to sanctify them and refine them in, in a fire. But Jesus here quotes that passage and particularly identifies it with his disciples. And so what he's saying is, that describes my disciples. They're going to fall away. They're going to be scattered. They're going to face this persecution, but that persecution is actually something here that is going to refine them in a refiner's fire. James talks about whenever you face trials of many kind, consider it pure joy because it builds up your faith. It strengthens you. First Peter talks about that refining fire that trials and persecution does. And that's what Zechariah is talking about. But notice this statement here. It says, I will turn my hand against the little ones. Little ones we can understand as the sheep. And in God's sovereign plan, he is going to allow his own sheep to face hardships of persecution. But ultimately, it's to refine them. Ultimately, it's for his good purpose. And that third remnant, those are the ones who are going to be like silver, purified, ready to to worship the Lord. Notice, they will say, the Lord is my God. They will be emboldened. They'll, they'll, they'll grow in their faithfulness. They'll learn from these trials. And isn't, is that not what the, happens to the disciples? They can look back on this in this moment of failure, but then the Lord's going to build them up again. He's going to gather them again. They're going to go and do great things for the Lord. They're going to be ready to die for him. So also notice, though, in Zechariah here, It's not just a a, a scattering that is prophesied here. Strike the sheep and they will scatter. Notice what else. He's going to gather them back. They will be my people. They will say the Lord is my God. He's going to restore them. He's going to gather them back to himself. So the scattering serves an ultimate purpose of building them up. God is using their own sinfulness, their own weakness, ultimately for his glory and his divine plan, which shows that he's sovereign, that he's in complete control. And so Christ tells them this ahead of time. 
It was the shepherd that they followed. It was the shepherd that gathered them together. It was the shepherd who fed them, who, who let them lie down on green pastures. All these things that he taught them, the word of God. And when he is struck down, they will run. They will abandon him in the hour they need him most. He needs them most. But this scattering will not be the ultimate falling away. But God's going to use that to drive them, to refine them, to be all the more devoted to him. But notice what else he says. He doesn't just say you're going to fall away. He says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Well, Jesus knows that he will be striked down. He knows he will die. That's ultimately the whole plan. That's the reason he came, is to earn the redemption for those who he's laying down his life for. He knows this is going to happen, but he also has also spoken about this numerous times. Whenever he speaks about his death, he also speaks about his resurrection. Mark 8, 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. We see that again in chapter 9. We see it again in chapter 10 of Mark. He tells them this, but for some reason, they're so fixated on the, the persecution, on the death, that they don't really listen to the promise of the resurrection. But they're reminded about it later, after he is raised. So he tells them, once again, I'm going to be raised. This is part of the divine decree. This is part of God's plan. This is going to happen. This is why I came. But then he says this, I will go before you to Galilee. So after I'm raised up, I will go before you. The idea of go before is something that describes what a shepherd does. He goes before the flock. He leads them. He fo they, the sheep follow. And this is what Jesus is saying. I'm going to be your shepherd again. I'm going to lead you to Galilee. And it's there where I'm going to commission you. He'll be raised. They'll be scattered. But he's going to gather them again to himself. He's going to restore them. One person says this. This is also another revelation of his love. For here Jesus assures them that he is going to meet them in the very region, Galilee, where their homes were, where the Lord had originally called them to himself. The prophecy that the disciples will desert Jesus and be scattered is counterbalanced by the promise of a reunion in Galilee, following the resurrection, in the context of the announcement of failure and denial on the part of the twelve. Galilee is designated as a place of restoration to Jesus and renewal. There, the scattered sheep will gather together and be reunited with their shepherd. But they don't hear that. They just hear, you're going to fall away. They hear that this is going to happen, that Jesus is going to die, and that's what triggers them. But Jesus wants to sh tell them this ahead of time to show he's sovereign, he's in control, he's in charge of all the circumstances around this, all the events. And this isn't by chance. And he's operating according to a divine plan and a divine timetable. Which leads us to the next point. Jesus knew the weakness and self-confidence of his disciples. Look at verse 29. He said, Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Again, Peter seems to not have focused on the words here about the resurrection, about being raised, about being regathered and united in Galilee. He just focuses on what Jesus just said about you will fall away. Peter, in his self-confidence and his pride, says, this will never happen to me, Jesus. Peter hears, really is hearing the words of Christ and rejecting it. No, Jesus, you're wrong. I'm not going to fall away. You would have thought maybe Peter replied, well, wow, that's, how can I not fall away, Lord? Help me. Help me. I know my own weakness. Help me to not do these things, Lord. What can I do? Give me the strength. Instead, you're wrong. I'm not going to fall away. I'm committed to you, Lord. Don't you remember who I am? I, I am Peter. You said on this rock, I'm a rock. I'm stable. I'm not going anywhere. This isn't the first time Peter opened up his mouth and said something, as we know. You would think he'd learned by now. You know, don't be quick to disagree with the Lord. 
In Mark 8, if you remember, Jesus told him he's going to suffer and die. He also said he'll be raised, but Peter didn't hear that. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And he told him, this will never happen to you. But Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're doing the work of Satan here, Peter. You're distracting me from my mission in the cross. This is what I have to do. This is what is written about me. Get behind me. But Peter, once again, doesn't learn from that. He opens up his mouth and says, Jesus, I know this is what you just said, but you're wrong. Not a very wise move to disagree with Jesus. He goes, Jesus... I know you just said, we'll all fall away, but these other disciples, sure, but, but not me. They'll fall. I mean, after all, we have a tax collector. We have a, a zealot amongst us. You can't really trust them. They'll fall, but not me. Peter really is, is seeing himself as superior to the others. That he's stronger, that, that he can't fall Peter also thinks he knows himself better than Jesus does. But Jesus knows his heart. Jesus has already shown that he's known his heart. And he's extremely self-confident and prideful. He's relying on his own strength. He's he's not resting in Jesus and what he says in his word, even though if he doesn't like what Jesus just said, he'd rather say he's wrong than, than trust Jesus in his word. What this shows is he doesn't really know himself and he doesn't know his heart. He's not fully trusting here in the word of the Lord. And also, if you, if you notice, Jesus is quoting this, the prophets and he's quoting the scriptures. And, and it's almost like Peter saying, well, I disagree with your interpretation, Jesus. Yes, the sheep, and yes, I'm a sheep, but not me. I, I'm the loyal sheep. I'm the sheep who's going to stand by the shepherd's side. I'll even even die with him. One person says he has an inflated opinion of himself. He's overconfident, conceited, and as events are going to quickly prove, that's the case. So Jesus then speaks up in verse 30, and Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Jesus here, again, gets his attention by saying, Truly. Truly I say to you, in other words, Peter, you better pay attention here. What I'm about to say is super important. Jesus here is is speaking as a prophet again. He's prophesying what's going to happen to Peter. Jesus is the great prophet. And notice he, he singles Peter out here. He's been speaking in the plural. You know, we could say, uh, if you look at the text again, we can look here. And he, he's talking about here, and he, and he, and he brings it out that you will all fall away. And this is the plural, like he's saying, y'all, y'all, y'all fall away. But now he gets singular here. Peter, you, you will deny me. This very night, you will deny me three times. He singles out Peter. Peter spoke first, so he, Jesus singles him out. And notice Jesus doesn't puff him up and say, you know what, I like your attitude. You know, I admire your your commitment to me, awesome. No, he doesn't puff him up, but he pushes the point. He wants to show Peter the self-deception that he has here. He's not trusting in the Lord, he's trusting in his own efforts and his own pride and his own strength. Not only are you going to fall away, not only are you going to be scattered, you're going to deny me three times. This must have broken Peter's heart. I mean, this is Peter who just said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, when no one else would say that. Peter said it, and Jesus now says, you're going to deny me three times. This word for deny means to disassociate, to disregard, or to abandon. And Peter has the ultimate form of denial here. He does it three times. We're going to see this comes to fulfillment even in this chapter. But notice this denying this falling away is not permanent falling away. Peter will be restored. Peter will go on to write the book of 1 and 2 Peter. He's going to be used by the Lord. But in this time of pride, Jesus shows him his 
failing. And that's going to humble him. And he's going to be used more for the glory of God after. But Peter, he's so zealous to, to defend Jesus. I will never do this. I'll never fall away from you. I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, no, actually, it's not some future thing that's going to happen. Like in the distant future, this is going to happen tonight. Before the sun rises, Peter, three times. Three times, before the rooster crows. This is kind of that uh, uh, poetic way to say, before the sun comes up. John's account gives us a bit more information here. In John 13, 36, uh, they were actually in the upper room, and apparently they had this discussion before. And they're, they're talking about, Jesus talking about, I must go away, prepare a place for you. And he's, he's talking to them, and Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Big commitment. Jesus said, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Now here we are again. Peter's doubling down and he's still not having it. I will not deny you. Luke's account also gives us some more information in Luke 22, verse 31. He brings out his old name, you know, Simon, not the rock. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan deemed to have you that he might shift you like wheat, sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. There's going to be three occasions where Peter is going to cave to the pressure. He's going to fear. He's going to see what's happening to Jesus and, and disassociate with him. He's going to fear the crowds. He even fears this little teenage girl who's pointing to him. Are you his follower? Well, no, I'm not. And he even begins cursing. Yet God in his sovereignty allows, uses the sin and weakness of his followers to accomplish his purposes in the end. Peter will be stronger. Peter will be more equipped. He'll be actually more humble. And he'll be able to build up his own brothers afterwards. But after, after he just said, you're going to deny me three times, you would think, okay, Lord, this is serious. Let me, help me be equipped to not deny you. What can I do? Instead, Peter says this in verse 31, but he said, emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. He doubles down. In other words, Jesus, you're wrong again. You're, you're not telling the truth here, Jesus. You need to trust me and my commitment to you. Peter still isn't believing the words of Jesus. And Jesus is speaking prophetically as the great prophet. Yet Peter thinks he knows better. Peter thinks he knows himself better. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He thinks he's going to be standing next to Jesus' side till the end. And Jesus says, no, this very night you're going to deny me three times. Peter continues in his self-perceived strength. He's blinded by his pride. He believes he has such strong faith, stronger than all the other disciples. But he's going to fall even harder than them. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Peter's the leader here. He's the leader of the group, of the disciples, and they're influenced by what Peter's saying, and they don't want to be shown up by Peter, so what happens? Notice the next sentence. They all said the same. All the disciples joined in and said, Jesus... We're not falling away. You're wrong. We understand your interpretation of this passage. That's wrong. 
We're not falling away. We're here to stay. Peter, as a leader, his sinful pride influences the others. And they all say, we will not deny you. They also believe that Jesus' words just aren't right. They're also blinded by their pride and and their self-perceived strength. But Jesus knows all their hearts. He knows that this has been written. He knows this is according to the Father's divine plan. And they're followers of Christ. They've walked with him for the past three years. They've heard his teaching. They've seen him do miraculous signs. And even these, these disciples of his, they're going to fall. And this should be a a wake-up call for us, that even the strongest believers, if they're blinded in pride like this, can fall. We can be blinded. We, We don't know fully the extent of our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, we can't. Other men can't, but God can. And Jesus knew each one of their hearts. And he knew their failings. He knew their sinful tendencies. He knew their fears. Apparently they feared man. Proverbs 29, 26 says, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Peter, in his own mind, is trusting in his own strength and his pride. He's not listening to the word of the Lord. One commentator says, the present sec- This present section has shown that we do not really know ourselves. All these disciples were very sure that they would never become ensnared into sin of being untrue to Jesus. Yet, that is exactly what happened. Romans 12, 3, For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think with sober judgment. They all thought more highly. They all said, we're not capable of falling away. We're not capable of being scattered, of denying you. And they're all blinded by their own pride and and self-perceived strength, just like Peter. Just imagine what Jesus must be feeling at this time. These are those whom he called. These are his friends he just spent the last three years with, riding in boats together, calming the seas, teaching them, wanting to see them grow in their faith, wanting to see them go out and teach the gospel as well. And then here they are, and they deny him. And he, he knows this is going to happen. Rather than how they acted just before this at the Lord's table, self examining themselves, and now they've flip flopped. And, ex- and, and, and Matthew even tells us they were arguing about who's the greatest even at the table. And so. What we see here is, again, they're built up in their pride, sinful pride. Yet, it's Jesus who chose them. It's Jesus who loved them. It's Jesus who brought them together. It's Jesus who's going to continue going and endure the cross for these same disciples. John 13, 1 says, When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Including their sinful tendencies, including them, let, let him, them letting them, him down. Jesus knew their heart. He knew their motives, yet he loved them the same. And he continued on the path of the cross for their sake and also for our sake. Notice also the emphasis here. In our passage, the last sentence here, and they all said the same. All. They all said the same thing of Peter. Again, look at the end of the chapter here. At the end here, look at verse 50. Chapter 14, verse 50. And they all left him and fled. So they did the exact opposite they said they would do, but they did the exact thing Jesus said they would do. But what happened before this? 
before he breaks this news, what happened? Verse 22. And he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it. Jesus had them participate in the supper, even though he knew they would go on to sin. Even though he knew they would fail him, Jesus welcomed them to his table. What this shows is the supper is not for perfect people, but for sinners who fail, who are covered by the grace, covered by the blood of the Lamb, because those are the ones whom Christ died. And coming to the table isn't something to say, well, we must have achieved this right to come. We must have behaved a certain way. No. We come confessing our sins to the Lord. We come holding on to Christ, our Passover lamb, because he's earned the work for us to partake in the table. It's a reminder that he still gave his life for sinners. And in doing so, we partake of the table. We are examining ourselves. We confess our sins, but we come before him resting in his work, not ours. And Jesus instituted the table, and in so doing, he's pointing us to himself, the Passover lamb, and he welcomes sinners to come to him. He covers our sins and atones for them, for those who place their trust in the lamb. One person said this, Christ knew this before, yet he welcomed them to, at his table. He sees the failings and miscarries of his disciples, and yet he does not refuse them. Nor should we be discouraged from coming to the Lord's Supper by the fear of relapsing into sin afterward. But the, great, the greater of our danger is, the more we need to have our fortified ourselves by the diligent use of of the ordinary ordinances. So Christ welcomed them to his table and showed them, you need to be reminded that I am your lamb, that my blood has atoned for you, that my body was crushed for you, even though you're going to fail me. And that we should take comfort in that. So as we close, I want to conclude by just saying, so often we can be like Peter, right? We can be like Peter. We can fail in many ways. Maybe, maybe it's pride like Peter. Maybe it's, it's this self-perceived strength that we can just muster it up by our, our own bootstraps. We can think more highly than we ought to think. We can be tempted to be proud. Think of ourselves better than others. Like Peter, we can also deny Jesus. There can be times when we're called to be a witness for him and we get scared. And we don't speak. We're silent. When we're called to give a defense for the hope that lies within and we're timid because of what people might think or the persecution that might arise. Like Peter, we can be ashamed to pretend that we don't know the Lord because of popularity. We want to be accepted. We want to feel cool in the eyes of others. Or just to avoid persecution. And we're called to speak hard things, to confront a world that is in sin. When we're tempted to do the things that the Bible forbids, the very sins Christ died for. Yet, in light of all that, we can take comfort that Jesus knows about this all beforehand. He knows the sins that we're going to do. He knows our heart. And he decides to love us anyways and give his life for us as a sacrificial lamb. James Montgomery Boyce says this, Yet our Lord's foreknowledge did not prevent his choosing of the twelve disciples to be his apostles. He allowed them to be his intimate friends and companions, knowing perfectly well what they would do one day do. He granted them the mighty privileges of being continually with him and of hearing his voice with a clear foresight of the melancholy weakness and want of faith which they would exhibit at the end of his ministry. Jesus knew their failings. He knew, he knew their weaknesses. Nevertheless, he chose them and he chose to die for them for his glory. And the same is true for us. 
God will take weak and flawed people and use them for his glory. 1 Corinthians 1.27, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And though we stumble and are tempted in many ways, he still died to make us his own. Hebrews 2.11 says, for, we, for he who sacrifices and those who are sacrificed all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. So maybe you're here today and you think, well, I've just failed too much. I, I can't approach the table. I can't be used by the Lord. These disciples had one of the most ultimate failures here. And God restores them. Christ restores them and gives them forgiveness and reconciliation. His disciples understood all the more of what grace looks like. They, he, they understood that God is using our failings and he's going to refine us. And God will go on to use them greatly for his glory. As they see Jesus and know him better and better, they understand themselves more and more. They understand that he died for them, that he is their true good shepherd, that he will gather them together, that he will, he will bring the straying sheep. And the same is true when we confess our sins and look to him as our true shepherd of our soul. But not only does Jesus do that, he also gives us a model of enduring suffering. He's one who can relate to us when we face suffering, persecution, abandonment. Jesus endured to the bitter, bitter end. In John 15, he tells them this. He encourages them. He, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours. But all these things they will do on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. In, verse, in chapter 16, he continues in verse 1. He says, all these things I have said to you to keep you from falling away. He says, I'm telling you about the persecution and trials and things you're going to endure. And I'm telling you these so you don't fall away. And then for the disciples in verse 32, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so when we face trials, hardships, persecutions, we can rest in Christ knowing we have comfort in him, that he sympathizes with us, that he was victorious all the way to the end, and his spirit is with us to guide us. And this is why we see in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So Jesus is the great shepherd of our souls, who knows our hearts, who knows our failings, who knows our weaknesses, and he seeks to use us for his glory as we look to him. So because Jesus is the Christ and on a divine schedule, he foretells that he will face abandonment, yet he presses on so that he can be our suffering servant and show that he's sovereign and in control. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for Christ who, who pressed on to be our, our sacrificial lamb, our suffering servant, so he can atone for our sins, so that he can... Use us for his glory, Lord. And so now we want to be instruments in your hands of those who've been redeemed. We want to be used by you. And Lord, we pray that we can check our hearts, that we see if there's any evil unbelief. Lord, help us to take heed lest we fall. And Lord, help us to look to you. Help us to, to rest in your finished work and to know the sinfulness of our heart, and that we need to depend on you for strength. So Lord, we thank you for all that you give us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.